A Good War from Unhappy Far-Off Things by Lord Dunsinay. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Dale Grothman. Nietzsche says, You have heard that a good cause justifies any war. But I say unto you, that a good war justifies any cause. A Good War by Lord Dunsinay A man was walking alone over a plain so desolate that, if you have never seen it, the mere word desolation would never convey to you the melancholy surroundings that mourned about this man on his lonely walk. Far off, a vista of trees followed a cheerless road, all dead as mourners suddenly stricken dead in some funereal procession by this road he had come but when he had reached a certain point he turned from the road at once branching away to the left led by a line of bushes that may once have been a lane for some while his feet had rustled through long neglected grass sometimes he lifted them up to step over a telephone wire that lolled over old entanglements and bushes Often he came to rusty strands of barbed wire and walked through where they had been cut, perhaps years ago, by huge shells. Then his feet hissed on through the grass again, dead grass that had hissed about his boots all through the afternoon. Once he sat down to rest on the edge of a crater, weary with such walking as he had never seen before. And after he had stayed there a little while, a cat that seemed to have its home in that wild place started suddenly up and leapt away over the weeds it seemed an animal totally wild and utterly afraid of man gray bare hills surrounded the waste a partridge called far off evening was drawing in he rose wearily and yet with a certain fervor as one that pursues with devotion a lamentable quest looking round him as he left his resting place he saw a cabbage or two that after some while had come back to what was a field and had sprouted on the edge of a shell hole a yellowing convivialist climbed up a dead weed weeds grass and tumbled earth were all about him it would be no better when he went on still he went on a flower or two peeped up among the weeds he stood up and looked at the landscape and drew no hope from that the shattered trunk of a stricken tree leered near him white trenches scarred the hillside he followed an old trench through a hedge of elder passing under more wire by a great rusty shell that had not burst passed by a dugout where something gray seemed to lie down at the bottom of many steps black fungi grew near the entrance he went on and on over shell holes passing round them when they were too deep stepping into or over the small ones little burrs clutched at him he went rustling on the only sound in the waste but a clicking of shattered iron now he was among nettles he came by some small unnatural valleys he passed more trenches only guarded by fungi while there was light he followed little paths marveling who made them once he got into a trench dandelions leaned across it as though to bar his way believing man to have gone and to have no right to return weeds thronged in thousands here it was a day of the weeds it was only they that seemed to triumph in those fields deserted by man he passed on down the trench and never knew whose trench it once had been frightful shells had smashed it here and there and had twisted iron as though round gigantic fingers that had twiddled it idly for a moment and let it drop to lie in the rain forever he passed more dugouts and black fungi, watching them, and then he left the trench, going straight on over the open. Again dead grasses hissed about his feet, 
Sometimes small wires sang faintly. He passed through a belt of nettles and thence of dead grass again. And now the light of the afternoon was beginning to dwindle away. He had intended to reach his journey's end by daylight, for he was past the time of life when one wanders after dark. But he had not contemplated the difficulty of walking over that road, or dreamed that lanes he knew could be foundered and merged in that mournful, desolate moor. Evening was filling fast. Still, he kept on. It was the time when cornstacks would once have begun to grow indistinct and slowly turn gray in the grayness, and the homesteads, one by one, would have lit their innumerable lights. But evening now came down on a dreary desolation, and a cold wind arose, and the traveler heard the mournful sound of iron flapping on broken things, and knew that this was the sound that would haunt the waste forever. And evening settled down, a huge gray canvas waiting for somber pictures, a setting for all the dark tales of the world haunted forever a grisly place was haunted ever in any century in any land but not by mere ghosts from all those thousands of graves and half-buried bodies and sepulcher shell holes haunted by things huger and more disastrous than that haunted by wailing ambitions under the stars or moon drifting across the rubbish that once was villages which strews the lonely plain the lost ambitions of two emperors and a sultan, wailing from wind to wind and whimpering for domination of the world. The cold wind blew over the blasted heath, and bits of broken iron flapped on and on. And now the traveller hurried, for night was falling, and such a night as three witches might have brewed in a cauldron. He went on eagerly, but with infinite sadness. Over the skyline strange rockets went up from the war, peered oddly over the earth, and went down again. Very far off a few soldiers lit a little fire of their own. The night grew colder. Tap, tap, went the broken iron. And at last the traveller stopped in the lonely night and looked around him attentively, and appeared to be satisfied that he had come within sight of his journey's end although to ordinary eyes the spot to which he had come differed in no way from the rest of the waste he went no further but turned round and round peering piece by piece at that weedy and cratered earth he was looking for the village where he was born the end of a good war by lord dunsinay The Great Valdez Sapphire by Anonymous. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Great Valdez Sapphire. I know more about it than anyone else in the world, its present owner not excepted. I can give its whole history from the Singalese who found it, the Spanish adventurer who stole it, the cardinal who bought it, the pope who graciously accepted it, the favoured son of the church who received it, the gay and giddy duchess who pawned it, down to the eminent prelate who now holds it in trust as a family heirloom. It will occupy a chapter to itself in my forthcoming work on historic stones, where full details of its weight, size, colour and value may be found. At present I am going to relate an incident in its history which, for obvious reasons, will not be published, which, in fact, I trust the reader will consider related in strict confidence. I had never seen the stone itself when I began to write about it, and it was not till one evening last spring, while staying with my nephew, Sir Thomas Acton, that I came within measurable distance of it. A dinner-party was impending, and, at my instigation, the Bishop of Northchurch and Miss Panton, his daughter and heiress, were among the invited guests. 
the dinner was a particularly good one i remember that distinctly in fact i felt myself partly responsible for it having engaged the new cook a talented young italian pupil of the admirable old chef at my club we had gone over the menu carefully together with a result refreshing in its novelty but not so daring as to disturb the minds of the innocent country guests who were bidden thereto the first spoonful of soup was reassuring and i looked to the end of the table to exchange a congratulatory glance with lita what was amiss no response her pretty face was flushed her smile constrained she was talking with quite unnecessary empressement to her neighbour sir harry landor though lita is one of those few women who understand the importance of letting a man settle down tranquilly and with an undisturbed mind to the business of dining allowing no topic of serious interest to come on before the relevé and reserving mere conversational brilliancy for the entremets guests all right no disappointments i had gone through the list with her selecting just the right people to be asked to meet the landers our new neighbours not a mere cumbrous county gathering nor yet a showy imported party from town but a skilful blending of both had anything happened already i had been late for dinner and missed the arrivals in the drawing-room it was lita's fault she has got into a way of coming into my room and putting the last touches on my toilet i let her for i am doubtful of myself nowadays after many years dependence on the best of valets her taste is generally beyond dispute but to-day she had indulged in a feminine vagary that provoked me and made me late for dinner are you going to wear your sapphire uncle paul she cried in a tone of dismay oh why not the ruby you would have your way about the table decorations i gently reminded her with that service of crown derby repoussé and orchids the ruby would look absolutely barbaric now if you would have had the limoges set white candles and a yellow silk centre oh but i'm so disappointed i wanted the bishop to see your ruby or one of your engraved gems my dear it is on the bishop's account i put this on you know his daughter is heiress of the great valdez sapphire of course she is and when he has the charge of a stone three times as big as yours what's the use of wearing it the ruby dear uncle paul please she was desperately in earnest i could see and considering the obligations which i am supposed to be under to her and tom it was but a little matter to yield but it involved a good deal of extra trouble studs sleeve links watch guard all carefully selected to go with the sapphire had to be changed the emerald which i chose as a compromise requiring more florid accompaniments of a deeper tone of gold and the dinner hour struck as i replaced my jewel case the one relic left me of a once handsome fortune in my fireproof safe the emerald looked very well that evening however i kept my eyes upon it for comfort when miss panton proved trying she was a lean yellow dictatorial young person with no conversation i spoke of her father's celebrated sapphires my sapphires she amended sourly though i am legally debarred from making any profitable use of them she furthermore informed me that she viewed them as useless gourds which ought to be disposed of for the benefit of the heathen i gave the subject up and while she discoursed on the work of the blue ribbon army among the bosemans i tried to understand a certain dislocation in the arrangement of the table surely we were more or less in number than we should be opposite side all right who was extra on ours i leaned forward lady landor on one side of tom on the other who i caught glimpses of plumes pink and green nodding over a dinner plate and beneath them a pink nose in a green visage with a nutcracker chin altogether unknown to me a sharp grey eye shot a sideway glance down the table and caught me peeping and i retreated having only marked in addition two claw-like hands with pointed ruffles and a mass of brilliant rings making good play with a knife and fork who was she at intervals a high acid voice could be heard addressing tom 
and a laugh that made me shudder. It had the quality of the scream of a bird of prey, or the yell of a jackal. I had heard that sort of laugh before, and it always made me feel like a defenceless rabbit. Every time it sounded, I saw Lita's fan flutter more furiously, and her manner grow more nervously animated. Poor dear girl, I never in all my recollection wished a dinner to end so earnestly as to assure her of my support and sympathy, though without the faintest conception why either should be required. The ice is at last. A menu card folded in two was laid beside me. I read it unobserved. Keep the bee from joining us in the dining-room. The bee? The bishop, of course. With pleasure. But why and how? That's the question. Never mind why. Could I lure him into the library, the billiard-room, the conservatory? I doubted it, and I doubted still more what I should do with him when I got him there. The bishop is a grand and stately ecclesiastic of the medieval type broad-chested, deep-voiced, martial of bearing. I could picture him charging mace in hand at the head of his vassals, or delivering over a dissenter of the period to the rack and thumbscrew, but not pottering among rare editions, tall copies and grolier bindings, nor condescending to a quiet cigar among the tree-ferns and orchids. Leta must and should be obeyed, I swore, nevertheless, even if I were driven to lock the door in the fearless old fashion of a bygone day, and declare I'd shoot any man who left while a drop remained in the bottles. The ladies were rising. The lady at the head of the line smirked and nodded her pink plumes coquettishly at Tom, while her hawk's eyes roved keen and predatory over us all. She stopped suddenly, creating a block and confusion. "'Ah, the dear bishop! You there, and I never saw you! You must come and have a nice long chat presently. Bye-bye. She shook her hand at him over my shoulder and tripped off. Lita, passing me at last, gave me a look of profound despair. Lady Carwitchet, somebody exclaimed. I couldn't believe my eyes. Thought she was dead or in penal servitude. Never should have expected to see her here, said someone else behind me confidentially. "'What Carwitchet? Not the mother of the Carwitchet who—' "'Just so. The Carwitchet who?' Tom assented with a shrug. "'We needn't go farther, as she's my guest. Just my luck. I met them at Buxton. Thought them uncommonly good company. In fact, Carwitchet laid me under a great obligation about a horse I was nearly let in for buying, and gave them a general invitation here, as one does, you know.' never expected her to turn up with her luggage this afternoon just before dinner to stay a week or a fortnight if carwitchet can join her a groan of sympathy ran round the table it can't be helped i've told you this just to show that i shouldn't have asked you here to meet this sort of people of my own free will but as it is please say no more about them the subject was not dropped by any means and i took care that it should not be at our end of the table one story after another went buzzing round sotto voce out of deference to tom but perfectly audible carl witchett ah yes mixed up in that rawlings divorce case wasn't he a bad lot turned out of the dragoon guards for cheating at cards or picking pockets or something remember the row at the seraline club scandalous exposure and that forged letter business oh that was the mother prosecution hushed up somehow ought to be serving her fourteen years and that business of poor farrer's the banker got hold of some of his secrets and blackmailed him till he blew his brains out it was so exciting that i clean forgot the bishop till a low gasp at my elbow startled me he was lying back in his chair his mighty shaven jowl a ghastly white his fierce imperious eyebrows drooping limp over his fish-like eyes his splendid figure shrunk and contracted he was trying with a shaken hand to pour out wine the decanter clattered against the glass and the wine spilled on the cloth i'm afraid you find the room too warm shall we go into the library he rose hastily and followed me like a lamb he recovered himself once he got into the hall and affably rejected all my proffers of brandy and soda medical advice 
everything else my limited experience could suggest. He only demanded his carriage directly, and that Miss Panton should be summoned forthwith. I made the best use I could of the time left me. "'I'm uncommonly sorry you do not feel equal to stay a little longer, my lord. I counted on showing you my few trifles of precious stones, the salvage from the wreck of my possessions, nothing in comparison with your own collection.' The bishop clasped his hand over his heart. His breath came short and quick. "'A return of that dizziness,' he explained with a faint smile. "'You are thinking of the Valdez Sapphire, are you not? "'Some day,' he went on with forced composure, "'I may have the pleasure of showing it to you. "'It is at my banker's just now.' Miss Panton's steps were heard in the hall. "'You are well known as a connoisseur, Mr. Acton,' he went on hurriedly. "'Is your collection valuable? "'If so, keep it safe. "'Don't trust a ring off your hand "'or the key of your jewel-case out of your pocket "'till the house is clear again.' "'The words rushed from his lips in an impetuous whisper. "'He gave me a meaning glance and departed with his daughter. "'I went back to the drawing-room, "'my head swimming with bewilderment. "'What? The dear bishop gone?' screamed Lady Cowichet from the central ottoman where she sat, surrounded by most of the gentlemen, all apparently well entertained by her conversation. "'And I wanted to talk over old times with him so badly. His poor wife was my greatest friend. Mira Montanaro, daughter of the great banker, you know. It's not possible that that miserable little prig is my poor Myra's daughter. The heiress of all the Montanaros in a black lace gown worth tuppence. "'When I think of her mother's beauty and her toilets, "'does she ever wear the sapphires? "'Has anyone ever seen her in them? Eleven large stones in a lovely antique setting, "'and the great Valdez sapphire worth thousands and thousands for the pendant.' "'No one replied. "'I wanted to get a rise out of the bishop tonight. "'I used to make him so mad when I wore this.' "'She fumbled among the laces at her throat "'and clawed out a pendant that hung to a velvet band, around her neck. I fairly gasped when she removed her hand. A sapphire of irregular shape flashed out its blue lightning on us. Such a stone, a true, rich cornflower blue, even by that wretched artificial light, with soft, velvety depths of colour and dazzling clearness of tint in its lights and shades. A stone to remember. I stretched out my hand involuntarily, but Lady Carwitchet drew back with a coquettish squeal. "'No, no, you mustn't look any closer. Tell me what you think of it now. Isn't it pretty?' "'Superb!' was all I could ejaculate, staring at the azure splendour of that miraculous jewel in a sort of trance. She gave a shrill, cackling laugh of mockery. "'The great Mr. Acton taken in by a bit of Palais Royal, Jim Crackery. What an advertisement for for Bogert's si. They are perfect artists in frauds. Don't you remember their stand at the first Paris exhibition? They had imitation there of every celebrated stone, but I never expected anything made by man could delude Mr. Acton. Never! And she went off into another mocking cackle, and all the idiots round her haw-hawed knowingly, as if they had seen the joke all along. I was too bewildered to reply, which was, on the whole, lucky. "'I suppose I mustn't tell why I came to give such a big sum in francs for this,' she went on, tapping her closed lips with her closed fan, and cocking her eye at us all like a parrot wanting to be coaxed to talk. "'It's a queer story.' I didn't want to hear her anecdote, especially as I saw she wanted to tell it. What I did want was to see that pendant again. She had thrust it back among her laces, only the loop which held it to the velvet being visible. It was set with three small sapphires, and even from a distance I clearly made them out to be imitations, and poor ones. I felt a queer thrill of self-mistrust. Was the large stone no better? Could I, even for an instant, have been dazzled by a sham, and a sham of that quality? The events of the evening had flurried and confused me, I wished to think them over in quiet. I would go to bed. My rooms at the manor are the best in the house. Lita will have it so. 
I must explain their position for a reason to be understood later. My bedroom is in the southeast angle of the house. It opens on one side into a sitting room in the east corridor, the rest of which is taken up by the suite of rooms occupied by Tom and Lita, and on the other side into my bathroom, the first room in the south corridor, where the principal guest chambers are, to one of which it was originally the dressing room. Passing this room, I noticed a couple of housemaids preparing it for the night, and discovered with a shiver that Lady Carwitchet was to be my next-door neighbour. It gave me a turn. The bishop's strange warning must have unnerved me. I was perfectly safe from her ladyship. The disused door into her room was locked, and the key safe on the housekeeper's bunch. It was also undiscoverable on her side the recess in which it stood being completely filled by a large wardrobe. On my side hung a thick soundproof portiere. Nevertheless, I resolved not to use that room while she inhabited the next one. I removed my possessions, fastened the door of communication with my bedroom, and dragged a heavy ottoman across it. Then I stowed away my emerald in my strong box. It is built into the wall of my sitting room, and masked by the lower part of of an old carved oak bureau. I put away even the rings I wore habitually, keeping out only an inferior cat's eye for workaday wear. I had just made all safe when Lita tapped at the door and came in to wish me good night. She looked flushed and harassed and ready to cry. Uncle Paul, she began, I want you to go up to town at once and stay away till I send for you. My dear, I was too amazed to expostulate. "'We've got a—a a pestilence among us,' she declared, her foot tapping the ground angrily. "'And the least we can do is go into quarantine. "'Oh, I'm so sorry and so ashamed. "'The poor bishop. "'I'll take good care that no one else shall meet that woman here. "'You did your best for me, Uncle Paul, and managed admirably, but it was all no use. "'I hoped against hope that what between the dusk of the drawing-room before dinner— and being put at opposite ends of the table, we might get through without a meeting. But, my dear, explain. Why shouldn't the bishop and Lady Carwitchet meet? Why is it worse for him than anyone else? Why? I thought everybody had heard of that dreadful wife of his, who nearly broke his heart. If he married her for her money, it served him right. But Lady Landor says she was very handsome and really in love with him at first. Then Lady Carwitchet got hold of her, and led her into all sorts of mischief. She left her husband, he was only a rector with a country living in those days, and went to live in town, got into a horrid far set, and made herself notorious. You must have heard of her. I heard of her sapphires, my dear, but I was in Brazil at the time. I wish you had been at home. You might have found her out. She was furious because her husband refused to let her wear the great Valdez sapphire. It had been in the Montenaro family for some generations, and her father settled it first on her and then on her little girl, the bishop being trustee. He felt obliged to take away the little girl and send her off to be brought up by some old aunts in the country, and he locked up the sapphire. Lady Carwitchet tells a splendid joke how they got the copy made in Paris and it did just as well for the people to stare at. No wonder the bishop hates the very name of the stone. "'How long will she stay here?' I asked dismally. "'Till Lord Carwitchet can come and escort her to Paris to visit some American friends. Goodness knows when that will be. Do go up to town, Uncle Paul.' I refused indignantly. The very least I could do was to stand by my poor young relatives in their troubles and help them through. I did so. I wore that inferior cat's eye for six weeks. It is a time I cannot think of even now without a shudder. The more I saw of that terrible old woman, the more I detested her, and we saw a very great deal of her. Lita kept her word, and neither accepted nor gave invitations all that time. We were cut off from all society but that of old General Fairford, who would go anywhere and meet anyone to get a rubber after dinner. The doctor, a sporting widower, and the doublies, a giddy, rather rackety young couple, who had taken the dower house for a year. Lady Carwitchet seemed perfectly content. She revelled in the soft living and good fare of the manor house, 
the drives in Lita's big barouche, and Domenico's dinners, as one to whom short commons were not unknown. She had a hungry way of grabbing and grasping at anything she could, the shillings she won at whist, the best fruit at dessert, the postage stamps in the library inkstand. That was infinitely suggestive. Sometimes I could have pitied her. She was so greedy, so spiteful, so friendless. She always made me think of some wicked old pirate putting into a peaceful port to provision and repair his battered old hulk, obliged to live on friendly terms with the natives, but his piratical old nostrils a sniff for plunder, and his piratical old soul longing to be off marauding once more. When would that be? Not till the arrival in Paris of her distinguished American friends, of whom we heard a great deal. Charming people, the Bochums of Chicago, the American branch of the English Beechams, you know. They seemed to be taken an unconscionable time to get there. She would have insisted on being driven over to North Church to call at the palace, but that the bishop was understood to be holding confirmations at the other end of the diocese. I was alone in the house one afternoon, sitting by my window, toying with the key of my safe, and wondering whether I dare treat myself to a peep at my treasures, when a suspicious movement in the park below caught my attention. A black figure certainly dodged from behind one tree to the next, and then into the shadow of the park paling, instead of keeping to the footpath. It looked queer. I caught up my field glass and marked him at one point, where he was bound to come into the open for a few steps. He crossed the strip of turf with giant strides and got into cover again, but not quick enough to prevent me recognise him. It was, great heavens, the bishop! In a soft hat pulled over his forehead, with a long cloak and a big stick, he looked like a poacher. Guided by some mysterious instinct, I hurried to meet him. I opened the conservatory door, and in he rushed like a hunted rabbit. Without explanation, I led him up the wide staircase to my room, where he dropped into a chair and wiped his face. "'You are astonished, Mr. Acton,' he panted. "'I will explain directly.' "'Thanks.' He tossed off the glass of brandy I had poured out, without waiting for the qualifying soda, and looked better. "'I am in serious trouble. You can help me. I've had a shock today, a grievous shock.' He stopped and tried to pull himself together. "'I must trust you implicitly, Mr. Acton. I have no choice. Tell me what you think of this.' He drew a case from his breast pocket and opened it. "'I promised you should see the Valdez Sapphire. Look there.' The Valdez Sapphire. A great, big, shining lump of blue crystal, flawless and of perfect colour. That was all. I took it up, breathed on it, drew out my magnifier, looked at it in one light and another. What was wrong with it? I could not say. Nine experts out of ten would undoubtedly have pronounced the stone genuine. I, by virtue of some mysterious instinct that has hitherto always guided me aright, was the unlucky tenth. I looked at the bishop. His eyes met mine. There was no need of spoken word between us. Has Lady Carwitchet shown you her sapphire? was his most unexpected question. She has? Now, Mr. Acton, on your honour as a connoisseur and a gentleman, which of the two is the Valdez? Not this one. I could say naught else. You were my last hope. He broke off and dropped his face on his folded arms with a groan that shook the table on which he rested, while I stood dismayed at myself for having let so hasty a judgment escape me. He lifted a ghastly countenance to me. She vowed she would see me ruined and disgraced. I made her my enemy by crossing some of her schemes once, and she never forgives. She will keep her word. I shall appear before the world as a fraudulent trustee. I can neither produce the valuable confided to my charge, nor make the loss good. I have only an incredible story to tell. He dropped his head and groaned again. Who will believe me? I will, for one. Ah, you. Yes, you know her. She took my wife from me, Mr. Acton. Heaven only knows what the hold was that she had over poor Mira. She encouraged her to set me at defiance, and eventually to leave me. 
she was answerable for all the scandalous folly and extravagance of poor Mira's life in Paris. Spare me the telling of the story. She left her at last to die alone and uncared for. I reached my wife to find her dying of a fever from which Lady Carwitchet and her crew had fled. She was raving in delirium and died without recognizing me. Some trouble she had been in, which I must never know, oppressed her. At the very last she roused from a long stupor and spoke to the nurse. Tell him to get the sapphire back. She stole it. She has robbed my child. Those were her last words. The nurse understood no English and treated them as wandering, but I heard them and knew she was sane when she spoke. What did you do? What could I? I saw Lady Carwitchet, who laughed at me, and defied me to make her confess or disgorge. I took the pendant to more than one eminent jeweller on pretense of having the setting seen to, and all have examined and admired without giving a hint of there being anything wrong. I allowed a celebrated mineralogist to see it. He gave no sign. Perhaps they are right and we are wrong. No, no. Listen. I heard of an old Dutchman celebrated for his imitations. I went to him, and he told me at once that he had been allowed by Montanaro to copy the Valdez. Setting and all, for the Paris exhibition. I showed him this, and he claimed it for his own work at once, and pointed out his private mark upon it. You must take your magnifier to find it. A Greek beta. He also told me that he had sold it to Lady Carwitchet more than a year ago. It is a terrible position. It is. My co-trustee died lately. I have never dared to have another appointed. I am bound to hand over the sapphire to my daughter on her marriage, if her husband consents to take the name of Montanaro. The bishop's face was ghastly pale, and the moisture started on his brow. I racked my brain for some word of comfort. Miss Panton may never marry. But she will, he shouted. That is the blow that has been dealt me today. My chaplain, actually my chaplain, tells me that he is going out as a temperance missionary to equatorial Africa, and has the assurance to add that he believes my daughter is not indisposed to accompany him. His consummating wrath acted as a momentary stimulant. He sat upright, his eyes flashing and his brow thunderous. I felt for that chaplain. Then he collapsed miserably. The sapphires will have to be produced, identified, revalued. How shall I come out of it? Think of the disgrace, the ripping up of old scandals. Even if I were to compound with Lady Carwitchet, the sum she hinted at was too monstrous. She wants more than my money. Help me, Mr. Acton, for the sake of your own family interests. Help me. I beg your pardon? Family interests? I don't understand. If my daughter is childless, her next of kin is poor Marmaduke Panton, who is dying at Cannes, not married or likely to marry. And failing him, your nephew, Sir Thomas Acton, succeeds. My nephew Tom? Lita or Lita's baby might come to be the possible inheritor of the great Valdez Sapphire. The blood rushed to my head as I looked at the great shining swindle before me. What diabolical jugglery was at work when the exchange was made? I demanded fiercely. It must have been on the last occasion of her wearing the sapphires in London. I ought never to have let her out of my sight. You must put a stop to Miss Panton's marriage in the first place, I pronounced as autocratically as he could have done himself. Not to be thought of, he admitted helplessly. Mira has my force of character. She knows her rights, and she will have her jewels. I want you to take charge of the thing for me. If it's in the house, she'll make me produce it. She'll inquire at the banker's. If you have it, we can gain time, if but for a day or two. He broke off. Carriage wheels were crashing on the gravel outside. We looked at one another in consternation. Flight was imperative. I hurried him downstairs and out of the conservatory, just as the doorbell rang. I think we both lost our heads in the confusion. He shoved the case into my hands, and I pocketed it without a thought of the awful responsibility I was incurring, 
and saw him disappear into the shelter of the friendly night. When I think of what my feelings were that evening, of my murderous hatred of that smirking, jesting Jezebel who sat opposite me at dinner, my wrathful indignation at the thought of the poor little expected heir defrauded ere his birth, of the crushing contempt I felt for myself and the bishop as a pair of witless idiots unable to see our way out of the dilemma, all this boiling and surging through my soul, I can only wonder, Domenico having given himself a holiday, and the kitchen maid doing her worst and wickedest, that gout or jaundice might not put an end to this story at once. "'Uncle Paul!' Lita was looking her sweetest when she tripped into my room next morning. "'I've news for you. She,' pointing a delicate forefinger in the direction of the corridor, "'is going. Her Bochums have reached Paris at last, and sent for her to join them at the Grand Hotel.' I was thunderstruck. The longed-for deliverance had but come to remove hopelessly and forever out of my reach Lady Carwitchet and the great Valdez Sapphire. "'Why, aren't you overjoyed?' "'I am. We are going to celebrate the event by a dinner-party. Tom's hospitable soul is vexed by the lack of entertainment we have provided her. We must ask the Brownleys some day or other, and they will be delighted to meet anything in the way of a ladyship, or such smart folks as the Duberley Parkers.' "'Then we may as well have the Blomfields and air that awful modern Sèvres dessert service she gave us when we were married. "'I had no objection to make, and she went on, rubbing her soft cheek against my shoulder, like the purring little cat she was. "'Now I want you to do something to please me and Mrs. Blomfield. "'She has set her heart on seeing your rubies, and though I know you hate her about as much as you do that Sèvres china—' "'What?' wear my rubies with that i won't i'll tell you what i will do though i've got some carbuncles as big as prize gooseberries a whole set then you have only to put those bohemian glass vases and candelabra on the table and let your gardener do his worst with his great force scentless vulgar blooms and we shall all be in keeping lita pouted an idea struck me or i'll do as you wish on one condition you get Lady Carwitchet to wear her big sapphire, and don't tell her I wish it. I lived through the next few days as one in some evil dream. The sapphires, like twin spectres, haunted me day and night. Was ever man so tantalised? To hold the shadow and see the substance dangled temptingly within reach. The bishop made no sign of ridding me of my unwelcome charge, and the thought of what might happen in a case of burglary, fire, earthquake, made me start and tremble at all sorts of inopportune moments. I kept faith with Lita and reluctantly produced my beautiful rubies on the night of her dinner party. Emerging from my room, I came full upon Lady Carwitchet in the corridor. She was dressed for dinner, and at her throat I caught the blue gleam of the great sapphire. Lita had kept faith with me. I don't know what I stammered in reply to her ladyship's remarks, my whole soul was absorbed in the contemplation of the intoxicating loveliness of the gem. That, a Palais-Royal deception, incredible. My fingers twitched, my breath came short and fierce with the lust of possession. She must have seen the covetous glare in my eyes. A look of gratified, spiteful complacency overspread her features as she swept on ahead and descended the stairs before me. I followed her into the drawing-room. She stopped suddenly, and, murmuring something unintelligible, hurried back again. Everybody was assembled there that I expected to see, with an addition. Not a welcome one, by the look on Tom's face. He stood on the hearth-rug, conversing with a great, hulking, high-shouldered fellow, sallow-faced, with a heavy moustache, and drooping eyelids, from the corners of which flashed out a sudden, suspicious look as I approached which lighted up into a greedy one as it rested on my rubies, and seemed unaccountably familiar to me, till Lady Carwitchet, tripping past me, exclaimed, "'He has come at last, my naughty, naughty boy. Mr. Acton, this is my son, Lord Carwitchet.' I broke off short in the midst of my polite acknowledgments to stare blankly at her. The sapphire was gone. A great gilt cross with a scotch pebble like an acid drop was her sole decoration. 
I had to put my pendant away, she explained confidentially. The clasp had got broken somehow. I didn't believe a word. Lord Carwitchet contributed little to the general entertainment at dinner, but fell into confidential talk with Mrs. Dubley Parker. I caught a few unintelligible remarks across the table. They referred, I subsequently discovered, to the lady's little book on North Church races, and I recollected that the spring meeting was on, and tomorrow cup day. After dinner there was great talk about getting up a party to go on General Fairford's drag. Lady Carwitchet was in ecstasies and tried to coax me into joining. Lita declined positively. Tom accepted sulkily. The look in Lord Carwitchet's eye returned to my mind as I locked up my rubies that night. It made him look so like his mother. I went round my fastenings with usual care. Safe and closets and desk and doors, I tried them all. Coming at last to the bathroom, it opened at once. It was the housemaid's doing. She had evidently taken advantage of my having abandoned the room to give it a thorough spring cleaning, and I had anathematized her. The furniture was all piled together and veiled with sheets. The carpet and felt curtain were gone. There were new brooms about. As I peered around, a voice close at my ear made me jump. Lady Carwitchet's. I tell you, I have nothing, not a penny. I shall have to borrow my train fare before I can leave this. They'll be glad enough to lend it. Not only had the portiere been removed, but the door behind it had been unlocked and left open for convenience of dusting behind the wardrobe. I might as well have been in the bedroom. Don't tell me, I recognised Carwitchet's growl. You've not been here all this time for nothing. You've been collecting for a Kilburn cot, or getting subscriptions for the distressed Irish landlords. I know you. Now I'm not going to see myself ruined for the want of a paltry hundred or so. I tell you the colt is a dead certainty. If I could have got a thousand or two on him last week, we might have ended our dog days millionaires. Hand over what you can. You've money's worth, if not money. Where's that sapphire you stole? I didn't. I can show you the receipted bill. All I possess is honestly come by. What could you do with it, even if I gave it you? You couldn't sell it as a Valdez, and you can't get it cut up, as you might if it were real. If it's only bogus, why are you always in such a flutter about it? I'll do something with it, never fear. Hand over. I can't. I haven't got it. I had to raise something on it before I left town. Will you swear it's not in that wardrobe? I dare say you will. I mean to see. Give me those keys. I heard a struggle and a jingle. Then a wardrobe door must have been flung open, for a streak of light struck through a crack in the wood of the back. Creeping close and peeping through, I could see an awful sight. Lady Carwitchet in a flannel wrapper, minus hair, teeth, complexion, pointing a skinny forefinger that quivered with rage at her son, who was out of the range of my vision. Stop that, and throw those keys down here directly, or I'll rouse the house. Sir Thomas is a magistrate, and will lock you up as soon as look at you. She clutched at the bell-rope as she spoke. I'll swear I'm in danger of my life from you, and give you in charge. Yes, and when you're in prison, I'll keep you there till you die. I've often thought I'd do it. How about the hotel robberies last summer at Cowes, eh? Mightn't the police be grateful for a hint or two? And how about— the keys fell with a crash on the bed, accompanied by some bad language in an apologetic tone, and the door slammed to. I crept trembling to bed. This new and horrible complication of the situation filled me with dismay. Lord Carwitchet's wolfish glance at my rubies took a new meaning. They were safe enough, I believed. But the sapphire! If he disbelieved his mother, how long would she be able to keep it from his clutches? That she had some plot of her own of which the bishop would eventually be the victim, I did not doubt, or why had she not made her bargain with him long ago? But supposing she took fright, lost her head, allowed her son to wrest the jewel from her, or gave consent to its being mutilated, divided, I lay in a cold perspiration till morning. My terrors haunted me all day. They were with me at breakfast-time when Lady Carwitchet, tripping in smiling, 
made a last attempt to induce me to accompany her and keep her bad, bad boy from getting among those horrible betting men. They haunted me through the long, peaceful day with Lita and the tete-a-tete -tete dinner, but they swarmed around and beset me sorest when, sitting alone over my sitting-room fire, I listened for the return of the drag party. I read my newspaper and brewed myself some hot, strong drink, but there comes a time of night when no fire can warm and no drink can cheer. The bishop's despairing face kept me company, and his troubles and the wrongs of the future heir took possession of me. Then the uncanny noises that make all old houses ghostly during the small hours began to make themselves heard. Muffled footsteps trod the corridor, stopping to listen at every door. Door latches gently clicked, boards creaked unreasonably, sounds of stealthy movements came from the locked-up bathroom. The welcome crash of wheels at last, and the sound of the front doorbell. I could hear Lady Carwitchet making her shrill adieus to her friends, and her steps in the corridor. She was softly humming a little song as she approached. I heard her unlock her bedroom door before she entered. An odd thing to do. Tom came sleepily stumbling to his room later. I put my head out. Where is Lord Carwitchet? Haven't you seen him? He left us hours ago. Not come home, eh? Well, he's welcome to stay away. I don't want to see more of him. Tom's brow was dark and his voice surly. I gave him to understand as much. Whatever had happened, Tom was evidently too disgusted to explain just then. I went back to my fire unaccountably relieved, and brewed myself another and stronger brew. It warmed me this time, but excited me foolishly. There must be some way out of the difficulty. I felt now as if I could almost see it, if I gave my mind to it. Why, suppose... There might be no difficulty after all. The bishop was a nervous old gentleman. He might have been mistaken all through. Vogertz might have been mistaken. I might... No. I could not have been mistaken. Or I thought not. I fidgeted and fumed and argued with myself till I found I should have no peace of mind without a look at the stone in my possession, and I actually went to the safe and took the case out. The sapphire certainly looked different by lamplight. I sat and stared, and all but over-persuaded my better judgment into giving it a verdict. Bogert's mark. I suddenly remembered it. I took my magnifier and held the pendant to the light. There, scratched upon the stone, was the Greek beta. There came a tap on my door, and before I could answer the handle turned softly, as Lord Carwitchet stood before me. I whipped the case into my dressing-gown pocket and stared at him. He was not pleasant to look at, especially at that time of night. He had a dishevelled, desperate air. His voice was hoarse, his red-rimmed eyes wild. "'I beg your pardon,' he began civilly enough. "'I saw your light burning and thought, as we go by the early train tomorrow, you might allow me to consult you now on a little business of my mother's.' His eyes roved about the room. Was he trying to find out the whereabouts of my safe? "'You know a lot about precious stones, don't you?' "'So my friends are kind enough to say. "'Won't you sit down? "'I have unluckily little chance of indulging the taste on my own account,' was my cautious reply. "'But you've written a book about them, and know them when you see them, don't you? "'Now my mother has given me something, and would like you to give a guess at its value. "'Perhaps you can put me in the way of disposing of it.' "'I certainly can do so, if it is worth anything. "'Is that it?' I was in a fever of excitement, for I guessed what was clutched in his palm. He held out to me the Valdez sapphire. How it shone and sparkled like a great blue star. I made myself a deprecating smile as I took it from him. But how dare I call it false to his face? As well accuse the sun in heaven of being a cheap imitation. I faltered and prevaricated feebly. Where was my moral courage, and where was the good, honest, thumping lie that should have aided me? I have the best authority for recognising this as a very good copy of a famous stone in the possession of the Bishop of North Church. His scowl grew so black that I saw he believed me, and I went on more cheerily. This was manufactured by Johannes Bogertz. I can give you his address, and you can make inquiries yourself. 
by special permission of the then owner the late leone montanaro hand it back he interrupted his other remarks were outrageous but satisfactory to hear but i waved him off i couldn't give it up it fascinated me i toyed with it i caressed it i made it display its different tones of colour i must see the two stones together i must see it outshine its paltry rival it was a whimsical frenzy that seized me i can call it by no other name would you like to see the original curiously enough i have it here the bishop has left it in my charge the wolfish light flamed up in carwitchet's eyes as i set forth the case he laid the valdez down on a sheet of paper and i placed the other still in its case beside it in that moment they looked identical except for the little loop of sham stones replaced by a plain gold band in the bishop's jewel carwitchet leaned across the table eagerly the table gave a lurch the lamp tottered crashed over and we were left in semi-darkness don't stir carwitchet shouted the paraffin is all over the place he seized my sofa blanket and flung it over the table where i stood helpless there that's safe now have you candles on the chimney-piece i've got matches he looked very white and excited as he lit up might have been an awkward job with all that burning paraffin running about he said quite pleasantly i hope no real harm is done i was lifting the rug with shaking hands the two stones lay as i had placed them no i nearly dropped it back again it was the stone in the case that had the loop with the three sham sapphires carwitchet picked up the other hastily so you say this is rubbish he asked his eyes sparkling wickedly and an attempt at mortification in his tone utter rubbish i pronounced with truth and decision snapping up the case and pocketing it lady carwitchet must have known it ah well it's disappointing isn't it good-bye we shall not meet again i shook hands with him most cordially good-bye lord carwitchet so glad to have met you and your mother it has been a source of the greatest pleasure i assure you i have never seen the carwitchets since the bishop drove over next day in rather better spirits miss panton had refused the chaplain it doesn't matter my lord i said to him heartily we've all been under some strange misconception the stone in your possession is the veritable one i could swear to that anywhere the sapphire lady carwitchet wears is only an excellent imitation and i have seen it with my own eyes is the one bearing bogart's mark the greek beta end of the great valdez sapphire by anonymous love and bread by august strunberg this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit LibriVox.org. Reading by Matt Berard. Love and Bread by August Strunberg. The assistant had not thought of studying the price of wheat before he called on the major to ask him for the hand of his daughter, but the major had studied it. I love her, said the assistant. What's your salary? said the old man. Well, twelve hundred crowns at present, but we love one another. That has nothing to do with me. Twelve hundred crowns is not enough and then i make a little in addition to my salary and louisa knows that my heart don't talk nonsense how much in addition to your salary he seized paper and pencil and my feelings how much in addition to your salary and he drew hieroglyphics on the blotting paper oh we'll get on well enough if only are you going to answer my question or not how much in addition to your salary figures figures my boy facts i do translations at ten crowns a sheet i give french lessons i am promised proof correcting promises aren't facts figures my boy figures look here now i'll put it down what are you translating what am i translating i can't tell you straight off you can't tell me straight off you are engaged on a translation you say can't you tell me what it is don't talk such rubbish i am translating guzot's history of civilization twenty-five sheets at ten crowns a sheet makes two hundred and fifty crowns and then and then how can i tell beforehand 
indeed can't you tell beforehand but you ought to know you seem to imagine that being married simply means living together and amusing yourselves no my dear boy there will be children and children require feeding and clothing there needn't be babies directly if one loves as we love one another how the dickens do you love one another as we love one another he put his hand on his waistcoat and won't there be any children if people love as you love you must be mad but you are a decent respectable member of society and therefore i will give my consent but make good use of the time my boy and increase your income for hard times are coming the price of wheat is rising the assistant grew red in the face when he heard the last words but his joy at the old man's consent was so great that he seized his hand and kissed it heaven knew how happy he was when he walked for the first time down the street with his future bride on his arm they both radiated light it seemed to them that the passers-by stood still and lined the road in honor of their triumphal march and they walked along with proud eyes squared shoulders and elastic steps in the evening he called at her house they sat down in the centre of the room and read proofs she helped him he's a good sort chuckled the old man when they had finished he took her in his arms and said now we have earned three crowns and then he kissed her on the following evening they went to the theatre and he took her home in a cab and that cost twelve crowns sometimes when he ought to have given a lesson in the evening he is there anything a man will not do for love's sake cancelled his lesson and took her out for a walk instead but the wedding day approached they were very busy they had to choose the furniture they began with the most important purchases louisa had not intended to be present when he bought the bedroom furniture but when it came to the point she went with him they bought two beds which were of course to stand side by side the furniture had to be walnut every single piece real walnut and they must have spring mattresses covered with red and white striped tick and bolsters filled with down and two eider-down quilts exactly alike louisa chose blue because she was very fair they went to the best stores they could not do without a red hanging lamp and a venus made of plaster of paris then they bought a dinner service and six dozen differently shaped glasses with cut edges and knives and forks grooved and engraved with their initials and then the kitchen utensils mamma had to accompany them to see to those and what a lot he had to do besides there were bills to accept journeys to the banks and interviews with tradespeople and artisans a flat had to be found and curtains had to be put up he saw to everything of course he had to neglect his work but once he was married he would soon make up for it they were only going to take two rooms to begin with for they were going to be frightfully economical and as they were only going to have two rooms they could afford to furnish them well he rented two rooms and a kitchen on the first floor in government street for six hundred crowns when louisa remarked that they might just as well have taken three rooms and a kitchen on the fourth floor for five hundred crowns he was a little embarrassed but what did it matter if only they loved one another yes of course louisa agreed but couldn't they have loved one another just as well in four rooms at a lower rent as in three at a higher yes he admitted that he had been foolish but what did it matter so long as they loved one another the rooms were furnished the bedroom looked like a little temple the two beds stood side by side like two carriages the rays of the sun fell on the blue eider-down quilt the white white sheets and the little pillow slips which an elderly maiden aunt had embroidered with their monogram the latter consisted of two huge letters formed of flowers joined together in one single embrace and kissing here and there wherever they touched at the corners the bride had her own little alcove which was screened off by a japanese screen the drawing-room which was also dining-room study and morning-room contained her piano which had cost twelve hundred crowns his writing-table with twelve pigeon-holes every single piece of it real walnut a pier-glass arm-chairs a sideboard and dining-table 
it looks as if nice people lived here they said and they could not understand why people wanted a separate dining-room which always looked so cheerless with its cane chairs the wedding took place on a saturday sunday dawned the first day of their married life oh what a life it was wasn't it lovely to be married wasn't marriage a splendid institution one was allowed one's own way in everything and parents and relations came and congratulated one into the bargain at nine o'clock in the morning their bedroom was still dark he wouldn't open the shutters to let in daylight but relighted the red lamp which threw its bewitching light on the blue eiderdown the white sheets a little crumpled now and the venus made of plaster of paris who stood there rosy red and without shame and the red light also fell on his little wife who nestled in her pillows with a look of contrition and yet so refreshed as if she had never slept so well in all her life there was no traffic in the street to-day for it was sunday and the church bells were calling people to the morning service with exulting eager voices as if they wanted all the world to come to church and praise him who had created men and women he whispered to his little bride to shut her eyes so that he might get up and order breakfast she buried her head in the pillows while he slipped on his dressing-gown and went behind the screen to dress a broad radiant path of sunlight lay on the sitting-room floor he did not know whether it was spring or summer autumn or winter he only knew that it was sunday his bachelor life was receding into the background like something ugly and dark the side of his little home stirred his heart with a faint recollection of the home of his childhood and at the same time held out a glorious promise for the future how strong he felt the future appeared to him like a mountain coming to meet him he would breathe on it and the mountain would fall down at his feet like sand he would fly away far above gables and chimneys holding his little wife in his arm he collected his clothes which were scattered all over the room he found his white necktie hanging on a picture frame it looked like a big white butterfly he went into the kitchen how the new copper vessels sparkled the new tin kettles shone and all of this belonged to him and to her he called the maid who came out of her room in her petticoat but he did not notice it nor did he notice that her shoulders were bare for him there was but one woman in all the world he spoke to the girl as a father would to his daughter he told her to go to the restaurant and order breakfast at once a first-rate breakfast porter and burgundy the manager knew his taste she was to give him his regards he went out of the kitchen and knocked at the bedroom door may i come in there was a little startled scream oh no darling wait a bit he laid the breakfast table himself when the breakfast was brought from the restaurant he served it on her new breakfast set he folded the dinner napkins according to all the rules of art he wiped the wine glasses and finally took her bridal bouquet and put it in a vase before her place when she emerged from her bedroom in her embroidered morning gown and stepped into the brilliant sunlight she felt just a tiny bit faint he helped her into the armchair, made her drink a little liquor out of a liquor glass, and eat a caviar sandwich. What fun it all was! One could please oneself when one was married. What would Mama have said if she had seen her daughter drinking liqueurs at this hour of the morning? He waited on her as if she were still his fiancée. What a breakfast they were having on the first morning after their wedding, and nobody had a right to say a word everything was perfectly right and proper one could enjoy oneself with the very best of consciences and that was the most delightful part of it all it was not for the first time that he was eating such a breakfast but what a difference between then and now he had been restless and dissatisfied then he could not bear to think of it now and as he drank a glass of genuine swedish porter after the oysters he felt the deepest contempt for all bachelors how stupid of people not to get married such selfishness they ought to be taxed to like dogs i'm sorry for those poor men who haven't the means to get married replied his demure little wife kindly for i am sure if they had the means they would all get married a little pang shot through the assistant's heart 
for a moment he felt afraid lest he had been a little too venturesome all this happiness rested on the solution of a financial problem and if if pooh a glass of burgundy now he would work they should see game with cranberries and cucumbers with cranberries and cucumbers the young wife was a little startled but it was really delicious lewis darling she put a trembling little hand on his arm can we afford it fortunately she said we pooh it doesn't matter for once later on we can dine on potatoes and herrings can you eat potatoes and herrings i should think so when you have been drinking more than is good for you and expect a beefsteak after the herring nonsense nothing of the kind your health sweetheart the game is excellent so are these artichokes but you are mad darling artichokes at this time of the year what a bill you will have to pay bill aren't they good don't you think that it is glorious to be alive oh it's splendid splendid at six o'clock in the afternoon a carriage drove up to the front door the young wife would have been angry if it had not been so pleasant to loll luxuriously on the soft cushions while they were being slowly driven to the deer park it's just like lying on a couch whispered lewis she playfully hit his fingers with her sunshade mutual acquaintances bowed to them from the footpath friends waved their hands to him as if they were saying hello you rascal you have come into a fortune how small the passers-by looked how smooth the street was how pleasant their ride on springs and cushions life should always be like that it went on for a whole month balls visits dinners theatres sometimes of course they remained at home and at home it was more pleasant than anywhere else how lovely for instance to carry off one's wife from her parents house after supper without saying as much as by your leave put her into a closed carriage slam the door nod to her people and say now we're off home to our own four walls and there we'll do exactly what we like and then to have a little supper at home and sit over it talking and gossiping until the small hours of the morning lewis was always very sensible at home at least in theory one day his wife put him to the test by giving him salt salmon potatoes boiled in milk and oatmeal soup for dinner oh how he enjoyed it he was sick of elaborate menus on the following friday when she again suggested salt salmon for dinner lewis came home carrying two ptarmigans he called to her from the threshold just imagine lou a most extraordinary thing happened a most extraordinary thing well what is it you'll hardly believe me when i tell you that i bought a brace of ptarmigans bought them myself at the market for guess his little wife seemed more annoyed than curious just think one crown the two i have bought ptarmigans at eightpence the brace but she added in a more conciliatory tone so as not to upset him altogether that was in a very cold winter well but you must admit that i bought them very cheaply was there anything she would not admit in order to see him happy she had ordered boiled groats for dinner as an experiment but after lewis had eaten a ptarmigan he regretted that he could not eat as much of the groats as he would have liked in order to show her that he was really very fond of groats he liked groats very much indeed milk did not agree with him after his attack of ague he couldn't take milk but groats he would like to see on his table every evening every blessed evening of his life if only she wouldn't be angry with him and groats never again appeared on his table when they had been married for six weeks the young wife fell ill she suffered from headaches and sickness it could not be anything serious just a little cold but the sickness had she eaten anything which had disagreed with her hadn't all the copper vessels new coatings of tin he sent for the doctor the doctor smiled and said it was all right what was all right oh nonsense it wasn't possible how could it have been possible no surely the bedroom paper was to blame it must contain arsenic let us send a piece to the chemist's at once and have it tested 
entirely free from arsenic reported the chemist how strange no arsenic in the wallpapers the young wife was still ill he consulted a medical book and whispered a question in her ear there now a hot bath four weeks later the midwife declared that everything was as it should be as it should be well of course only it was somewhat premature but as it could not be helped they were delighted fancy a baby they would be papa and mamma what should they call him for of course it would be a boy no doubt it would but now she had a serious conversation with her husband there had been no translating or proof correcting since their marriage and his salary alone was not sufficient yes they had given no thought to the morrow but dear me one was young only once now however there would be a change on the following morning the assistant called on an old school friend a registrar to ask him to stand security for a loan you see my dear fellow when one is about to become a father one has to consider how to meet increasing expenses quite so old man answered the registrar therefore i have been unable to get married but you are fortunate in having the means the assistant hesitated to make his request how could he have the audacity to ask this poor bachelor to help him to provide the expenses for the coming event this bachelor who had not the means to found a family of his own he could not bring himself to do it when he came home to dinner his wife told him that two gentlemen had called to see him what did they look like were they young did they wear eyeglasses then there was no doubt they were two lieutenants old friends of his whom he had met at vaxholm no they couldn't have been lieutenants they were too old for that then he knew they were old college friends from upsala probably p who was a lecturer and o who was a curate now they had come to see how their old pal was shaping as a husband no they didn't come from upsala they came from stockholm the maid was called in and cross-examined she thought the callers had been shabbily dressed and had carried sticks sticks i can't make out what sort of people they can have been well we'll know soon enough as they said they would call again but to change the subject i happened to see a basket of hothouse strawberries at a really ridiculous price it really is absurd just imagine hothouse strawberries at one and sixpence a basket and at this time of year but my darling what is this extravagance to lead to it'll be all right i have got an order for a translation this very day but you are in debt lewis trifles mere nothings it'll be all right when i take up a big loan presently a loan but that'll be a new debt true but there'll be easy terms don't let's talk business now aren't these strawberries delicious what a glass of sherry with them would be tip-top don't you think so lena run round to the stores and fetch a bottle of sherry the best they have after his afternoon nap his wife insisted on a serious conversation you won't be angry dear will you angry i good heavens no is it about household expenses yes we owe money at the stores the butcher is pressing for payment the man from the livery stables has called for his money it's most unpleasant is that all i shall pay them to the last farthing to-morrow how dare they worry you about such trifles they shall be paid to-morrow but they shall lose a customer now don't let's talk about it any more come out for a walk no carriage well we'll take the car to the deer park it will cheer us up they went to the deer park they asked for a private room at the restaurant and people stared at them and whispered they think we are out on a spree he laughed but what fun what madness but his wife did not like it they had a big bill to pay if only we had stayed at home we might have bought such a lot of things for the money months elapsed the great event was coming nearer and nearer a cradle had to be bought and baby clothes a number of things were wanted the young husband was out on business all day long the price of wheat had risen hard times were at hand he could get no translations no proof correcting men had become materialists they didn't spend money on books they bought food what a prosaic period we were living in ideals were melting away 
one after the other and ptarmigans were not to be had under two crowns the brace the livery stables would not provide carriages for nothing for the cab proprietors had wives and families to support just as everybody else at the stores cash had to be paid for goods oh what realists they all were the great day had come at last it was evening he must run for the midwife and while his wife suffered all the pangs of childbirth he had to go down into the hall and pacify the creditors at last he held a daughter in his arms his tears fell on the baby for now he realized his responsibility a responsibility which he was unable to shoulder he made new resolutions but his nerves were unstrung he was working at a translation which he seemed unable to finish for he had to be constantly out on business he rushed to his father-in-law who was staying in town to bring him the glad news we have a little daughter well and good replied his father-in-law can you support a child not at present for heaven's sake help us father i'll tide you over your present difficulties i can't do more my means are only sufficient to support my own family the patient required chickens which he bought himself at the market and wine at six crowns the bottle it had to be the very best the midwife expected a hundred crowns why should we pay her less than others hasn't she just received a check for a hundred crowns from the captain very soon the young wife was up again she looked like a girl as slender as a willow a little pale it was true but the pallor suited her the old man called and had a private conversation with his son-in-law no more children for the present he said or you'll be ruined what language from a father aren't we married don't we love one another aren't we to have a family yes but not until you can provide for them it's all very fine to love one another but you mustn't forget that you have responsibilities his father-in-law too had become a materialist oh what a miserable world it was a world without ideals the home was undermined but love survived for love was strong and the hearts of the young couple were soft the bailiff on the contrary was anything but soft distraint was imminent and bankruptcy threatened well let them distrain then the father-in-law arrived with a large travelling coach to fetch his daughter and grandchild he warned his son-in-law not to show his face at his house until he could pay his debts and make a home for his wife and child he said nothing to his daughter but it seemed to him that he was bringing home a girl who had been led astray it was as if he had lent his innocent child to a casual admirer and now received her back dishonoured she would have preferred to stay with her husband but he had no home to offer her and so the husband of one year's standing was left behind to watch the pillaging of his home if he could call it his home for he had paid for nothing the two men with spectacles carted away the beds and bedclothes the copper kettles and tin vessels the dinner set the chandelier and the candlesticks everything everything he was left alone in the two empty wretched rooms if only she had been left to him but what should she do here in these empty rooms no she was better off where she was she was being taken care of now the struggle for a livelihood began in bitter earnest he found work at a daily paper as a proof corrector he had to be at the office at midnight at three in the morning his work was done he did not lose his birth for bankruptcy had been avoided but he had lost all chance of promotion later on he is permitted to visit wife and child once a week but he is never allowed to see her alone he spends saturday night in a tiny room close to his father-in-law's bedroom on sunday morning he has to return to town for the paper appears on monday morning he says good-bye to his wife and child who are allowed to accompany him as far as the garden gate he waves his hand to them once more from the furthest hillock and succumbs to his wretchedness his misery his humiliation and she is no less happy he has calculated that it will take him twenty years to pay his debts and then even then he cannot maintain a wife and child and his prospects he has none if his father-in-law should die his wife and child would be thrown on the street he cannot venture to look forward to the death of their only support 
oh how cruel it is of nature to provide food for all her creatures leaving the children of men alone to starve oh how cruel how cruel that life has not ptarmigans and strawberries to give to all men how cruel how cruel End of love and bread by august strindberg